Reading further, the article explains that by comparing orbital observations of previous landing sites to ground truth, that is, the analysis of samples brought back by the Luna landing sites, the ESA scientists had greater confidence that their equipment was working correctly. This exact comment about ground truth appears verbatim in an earlier ESA article from July 20, 2006, which states that the Apollo landing sites were used as calibration points because they already had detailed analysis of what minerals should be there. By comparing the DES-6 measurements to ground truths in those areas and getting a match, they were then more certain that their equipment was functioning correctly. Neither of these two articles said anything about verifying the samples from the Apollo missions. The August 2006 article suggests the exact opposite. Ever since American astronauts brought back samples of moon rock during the Apollo moon landings of the late 1960s, early 1970s, planetary scientists have been struck by the broad similarity of the moon rocks and the rocks found deep in the Earth, in a region known as the mantle. This boosted the theory that the moon formed from debris left over after the Earth was struck a glancing blow by a Mars-sized planet. However, the more scientists looked at the details of the moon rock, the more discrepancies they found between them and the Earth rocks. Most importantly, the isotopes found in the moon rocks did not agree with those found on Earth. The get out clause is that the rocks returned from the Apollo missions represent only highly specific areas on the lunar surface, and so may not be representative of the lunar surface in its entirety, says Grande. Hence the need for DCIXS and its data. By measuring the abundance of several elements across the lunar surface, scientists can better constrain the contribution of material from the young Earth and its possible impactor to condense and form the Moon. Current models suggest that more came from the impactor than from Earth. Models of the Moon's evolution and interior structure are necessary to translate the surface measurements into the Moon's bulk composition. DCIXS was a small experimental device, only about the size of a toaster. ESA is now collaborating with India to fly an upgraded version on the Indian lunar probe Chandrayaan, due for launch in 2007 to 2008. It will map the chemistry of the lunar surface, including the other landing sites from where samples have been brought back to Earth. In this way, it will show whether the Apollo and Russian landing sites were typical or special. From SMART-1 observations of previous landing sites, we can compare orbital observations to the ground truth and expand from the local to global views of the moon, says Bernard Foeing, project scientist for SMART-1. This is the scenario that requires a roadmap to figure out. Let's break it down piece by piece. In the first two paragraphs, it sounds very much like Isra is saying that analysis of the Apollo samples led scientists to doubt the giant impact theory due to differences between Earth rocks and Apollo samples. That seems to be the BBC's interpretation too, despite airing a whole documentary on how Hartman's theory is absolutely correct. One theory is that 4.6 billion years ago, an object the size of Mars collided with the Earth. Somehow the Earth survived and the pieces knocked off it were sent into orbit. Eventually that debris clumped together to form our Moon. But doubt was cast on that theory when Apollo astronauts analysed Moon rock. They found that it may not once have come from Earth. For argument's sake, and giving ESA the benefit of the doubt, let's see if there's any minute alternative interpretation. ESA rightly states that the Apollo samples have broad similarities to terrestrial mantle rocks. Fine, no argument there. But in the next breath, they state there are broad discrepancies that call into question the theory that explains the aforementioned broad similarities. Why in one paragraph say the Apollo samples are the same, and yet in the next one say the exact opposite? Unless, unless of course in the next paragraph, ESA is not talking about the rocks retrieved by the astronauts. Could it be that the details of the moon rock in question are the details obtained from the DCIXS, in which case the X-ray scan shows the actual moon rocks up there to be different in composition to the ground truth? This possible interpretation seems to be entertained in the next paragraph, in which Grandy states the same thing as Phil Edwards, that the composition of the moon is diverse and the composition of the Apollo sites may not be typical. As pointed out previously, this statement conflicts with Koratev's that the composition of the lunar surface should be the same throughout, 
due to mappings made by the Clementine and Lunar Prospector and the vast majority of official lunar meteorites being the same as the Apollo samples. Next we are told that the current model for the Moon, due to the measurements made by the DCIXS, leads ESA to conclude that the majority of the Moon's material came from the Mars-sized impactor, rather than the Earth, and thus the overall composition of the Moon, according to the scans, is different to the Earth and similar to the impactor. Okay? But what this paragraph fails to mention is that scientists, such as Ruzicka and his team, believed the impactor must have had a eucritic composition to account for the similarities between Apollo rocks and eucrites. The central theses of our work are that the composition of the Moon is not unique in the solar system, that it resembles the composition of the parent body of HED meteorites, likely the asteroid 4 Vesta, to a remarkable extent, and that geochemical data do not support an origin of the Moon by rotational fission or small impact collisional ejection. Furthermore, the data are consistent with a giant impact origin for the Moon, only if the Moon largely inherited the composition of the impactor. Back in Episodes 2 and 3, we demonstrated how the three groups of rock, terrestrial basalts, eucrites and Apollo samples, are about as identical as three of a kind. So if the Moon inherited mostly the impactor's debris, the overall material should not be as different to Earth rocks as the DCIXS results make it out to be. Next we come to the paragraph that immediately preceded the following quote. DCIXS was a small experimental device, only about the size of a toaster. ESA is now collaborating with India to fly an upgraded version on the Indian lunar probe Chandrayaan, due for launch in 2007 to 2008. It will map the chemistry of the lunar surface, including the other landing sites from where samples have been brought back to Earth. In this way, it will show whether the Apollo and Russian landing sites were typical or special. Clearly, this section is talking about future chemical mappings that will be made by the Chandrayaan-1, NASA and India's joint project, not the SMART-1. If the Apollo landing sites were verified by SMART-1 at the time this article was published, shouldn't the paragraph read, It mapped the chemistry of the lunar surface, not It will map the chemistry of the lunar surface. As for the following paragraph, the one Webb points to, From SMART-1 observations of previous landing sites, we can compare orbital observations to the ground truth and expand from the local to global views of the Moon, says Bernard Foeing, project scientist for SMART-1. Foeing doesn't specify which of the landing sites he's talking about. He says nothing about verifying the Apollo landing sites. And the only landing sites that this article says was verified are the Russian landing sites. The second article that Webb shows us, in a lame attempt to try and allege the Apollo chemistry was verified by SMART-1, is titled, SMART-1 Birthday Card of the Apollo 11 Site. I find it interesting that Webb doesn't quote this article, and instead zooms down to the last two paragraphs. He alleges that this web page says, that the DCIXS was used to verify the Apollo geology. But DCIXS isn't even mentioned in this article. Here's what was actually said. This image, taken by the Advanced Moon Imaging Experiment, AMI, on board ESA's Smart One spacecraft, shows the Apollo 11 landing site in the Mare Tranquillitatis on the Moon. Smart One's AMI camera obtains this image on February 5, 2006, from a distance of 1,764 kilometers from the surface, with a ground resolution of 159 meters per pixel. The imaged area is centered at a longitude of 23.9 degrees east, close to the Moon equator, at 1.7 degrees latitude. The area in this image is close to Crater Moltke, just out of view, in the Mare Tranquillitatis. The arrow shows the landing site of Apollo 11, where the first men from Earth set foot on another object in our solar system on July 20th, 1969. The two prominent craters nearby are named after two of the Apollo 11 astronauts. The first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, has a crater named after him outside the field of this image. As can be seen from the image, the area which was selected for the first landing has a fairly featureless on a large-scale, smooth surface. This was done on purpose to make the landing easier. The landing sites of the Apollo missions 
are important calibration targets for lunar remote sensing missions. As these are the places from where material was brought back to Earth and analyzed in detail. The age of the rocks returned with Apollo can be determined with radioisotopic dating methods to very high accuracy and give reference points to remote sensing instruments. From Smart One observations of previous landing sites, we can compare remote observations to the ground truth and expand from local to global views of the moon, said Bernard Foeing, ESA's Smart One project scientist, and we can better define potential sites for future landers. This image is a mosaic of several filter images of Amy, the boundaries of which can be seen by thin horizontal lines. North is up. Clearly, this article is not talking about Smart One verifying the Apollo geology, it's simply saying that Smart One's cameras photograph the landing site at 159 meters per pixel. The article makes a passing mention of remote sensing in general, but doesn't say anything as to whether or not the Apollo sites were verified by the Smart One's remote sensing. Webb is clearly clutching at straws. Reading between these two articles, there are some more anomalies. Whereas the August 2006 article discusses remote sensing of calcium, the passing mention in the July 2007 article discusses finding rocks of similar age alone. It does not even refer to elemental compositions, only radiometric dating. Remote radiometric dating is pretty flimsy evidence for determining what is a moon rock and what isn't a moon rock. I mean, Chondrites are also as old as the Apollo samples, and even Webb agrees that there are no chemical or mineralogical similarities between the two groups of rock. In fact, further evidence that Smart One did not verify the Apollo sites is the fact that the ESA article suddenly declared the giant impact theory to be in doubt, due to apparent differences between Earth rocks and Apollo samples. Ever since American astronauts brought back samples of moon rock during the Apollo moon landings of the late 1960s, early 1970s, planetary scientists have been struck by the broad similarity of the moon rocks and the rocks found deep in the Earth, in a region known as the mantle. This boosted the theory that the moon formed from debris left over after the Earth was struck a glancing blow by a Mars-sized planet. However, the more scientists looked at the details of the moon rock, the more discrepancies they found between them and the earth rocks. Most importantly, the isotopes found in the moon rocks did not agree with those found on earth. Where did that come from? A minute ago, the giant impact theory was the absolute theory for the moon's origin. It accounted for the identical properties between earth rocks and moon rocks and the alleged lack of water in the moon rocks. Then in 2006, after ESA scans the lunar surface, we are suddenly told that this theory is in doubt because Earth rocks differ from Moon rocks? Later when Smart One crashed and the BBC ran their coverage on the crash, they too backpedaled despite airing a one hour documentary on how the giant impact theory is absolutely correct because Moon rocks are the same as Earth rocks minus water. One theory is that 4.6 billion years ago, an object the size of Mars collided with the Earth. Somehow the Earth survived and the pieces knocked off it were sent into orbit. Eventually that debris clumped together to form our Moon. But doubt was cast on that theory when Apollo astronauts analysed Moon rock. They found that it may not once have come from Earth. Why would NASA and ESA suddenly need to recant on the giant impact theory Unless, of course, the material that is actually up there is in fact different to Earth rocks and Apollo samples. Clearly, NASA knew that Smart One did not and could not verify the Apollo geology, and so they needed a cover story. In this case, claiming the Apollo rocks in fact differ to Earth rocks, and thus the Moon may not once have been part of the Earth at all. Like I said in Exhibit D, when pressed with incriminating evidence, NASA must rewrite their scientific data and historical record, and thus everyone must shed themselves of the old data. Could this be the reason for Webb's exclusion of this section? Apparently so. And as a final SWAT song, Webb chooses to finish his series on moon rocks with yet another straw man. And not just any straw man, a straw man of epic proportions.